I'm going to be speaking very quietly because we have a little baby here and we also have two very tired parents. But I do want to share my testimony with you of what we experienced in the last, well, really what we experienced in the last day, but also what we experienced during this pregnancy. The kids got married a little bit over, well, now it would probably be about 10 months or nine and a half months. And prior to that, my daughter had been told that she could not have children. But even their marriage, as I've mentioned to you in other videos, I raised my daughter not to get married. I was afraid of that. And that was something that I had to correct with her and talk with her about that I felt that it was important that they got married and um, they wanted to get married. And when I spoke with them about it, I had, I, I think I shared with you that I had, I was taking a shower one day and God started talking to me and he started putting this question on me of whether or not marriage was important to him. And so I asked him, you know, you know, the way that I was raised, um, I don't think I mentioned this in the book, but my dad married into millions and he put his wife on a budget. <laughs> he put his wife on a budget on her own money, but he spent it very frivolously and, you know, uh, on himself. And that just really scarred me from, from marriage. But as Christ started to draw me to himself, one of the things that he was correcting was this fear of marriage and how I had raised my daughter. And I tell you all the time, he's going to heal you first. And then he's going to work in your house through you. He's going to teach you how to walk in the authority he's given you correctly. And so that was something that I needed to correct with my daughter. And so I spoke with my kids about that with my son-in-law now and my daughter and let them know that this was something that God was putting on my heart. Well, we had a whole situation around that that was very interesting because he started talking with me about some very large diamond earrings that I had bought myself for my 40th birthday. And I couldn't wear them anymore because I was so disgusted by them. I was so disgusted <laughs> and felt so worldly. It just felt really detestable. It felt like an idol. And I couldn't feel good about them anymore. And I had been praying, what do you want me to do with them? Do you want me to sell them and give money to the poor? What would you like me to do with them? And my son-in-law at the time had, you know, he, he really wanted to ask her to marry him, my daughter to marry him, but he wanted to give her the ring that he felt she deserved. And, you know, to be honest, my daughter's not materialistic. She would have taken a, a zip tie on her finger. Um, she just, you know, they have a very precious love between them. But I had scheduled an appointment with a jeweler unbeknownst to my son-in-law just just to go looking at rings and to propose that I would that I would help him by um you know trading in those earrings. Well, I say it was unbeknownst to him because I know that he is a man of integrity and he does not like to take help from me. He wants to show that he is the man who will provide and and these things. And I really respect that about him. I think it would be very different if he just readily accepted everything from me. That would not be a good sign. But um, so I didn't say anything to him and I was going to just simply propose it to him. And I had been praying for God to change his heart as well. And this had been going on for about a month that I was praying about this, that that he would accept help from me. And it wasn't unusual for me to have like, you know, a day where I spent with him because we have our own personal relationship or a day that I spent separately with my daughter. So I asked, I sent a message asking the kids, hey, can I have a like an individual day with each of you? And immediately he responded yes, which was kind of unusual because usually he's got to kind of move around schedules and stuff like that with school and work and that sort of thing. But he immediately responded yes. And the day that we were supposed to get together, I had this appointment scheduled and I did not say anything to him about it. And he showed up at my house wearing a suit at my back door. And I thought I got a little nervous. Like I didn't understand why are you wearing a suit to come and hang out with me? So we came, he, we came into the living room and I said, you know, I'll look at you in your suit. You look so cute. And then he didn't really say anything. Well, he, he came into the living room and he said, well, this is a, a special day. And I knew when he said that, I said, are you going to ask for Tori's hand? And we both just started crying. And I told him, I have this appointment scheduled to go to my jeweler and this is what I, you know, this is what I've been praying about. This is what God has been putting on my heart. And he said, he started to share with me that he'd been going on these morning runs 
and God had been really talking with him on those runs and telling him, everything's going to be okay. I'm going to provide and I will provide a way for you to, for you to give her, you know, for you to be able to do this. And, um, of course he didn't know, you know, to, and Tori w- w- would send us pictures of rings and things like that. But, you know, that week she had sent us a picture of a ring that she really loved. And I sent it off to my jeweler and the rest is history. He and I went to the, to the jeweler. We got the ring that she loved. Again, it's not the star of the show. The star of the show is what God was doing and how he brought everything into perfect conformity. And, you know, I'm going to tell you something else. When they were in, they, they, they became very close. They knew each other at school and then they became very close when they went to a study abroad program in Spain. And while they were there, they had they had ended up being becoming, God had kind of conformed things for them to become very isolated. And they developed this really amazing friendship while they were studying abroad in Spain. And so, I mean, there's just no shortage of stories of, of how God conformed things in order for them to be together and how he's grown each of them as people of God. You know, one of the things he was sharing with me, which was really precious that day that he asked for her hand is that he was saying that he had gotten like a couple thousand dollars from some sort of a grant or something like that with school. And he said, I know it's not much, but it it just really confirmed that he that what he was telling me that he would provide, that it was true. And so I told him about my plan, my, my sneaky little plan. And we got that ring that day. Now, one of the things that my daughter had been told is that she was not able to have a baby. And this is, you know, of course, back when we were deferring to doctors, but she was told she couldn't have a baby. And even though the two of them really wanted a baby, they had already started grieving that. Like they were already, had already talked about that, that it might not happen for them. And do you know that within a week of them being married, after their marriage, God put a baby in that girl. Oh, I forgot to tell you that that day that I was talking with God in the shower, he was putting that question on me, ask me. And, and what he said to me was, he put the question on me about whether or not God loves marriage, whether or not that was important to him. And he said, ask me the question. And I thought, okay, well, I'm going to ask him this question and he's going to answer it over a period of time. I asked him the question and immediately he said to me, covenant. And I thought, oh, well, of course, of course, marriage is important to you. You've likened your covenant with us to marriage or likened the marriage covenant to the covenant that you have with us. Of course, it's important. And so that was where things changed for me and I had to start orienting myself. So within a week of them getting married, she was pregnant. And you know, all through this time, God is pulling us out of Babylon and he's pulling Babylon out of us, growing us and conforming us, molding us as the potter does. She gets pregnant. And you know how I feel about doctors. I don't see doctors at all. I do not defer whatsoever to the sciences at all. I will listen to what they say in terms of observation, but I will not listen to the explanations that they develop because the explanations that they develop have nothing to do with truth. They don't stand on the word of God. Anyone can observe. But even in listening to observations, we have to be very careful because depending on who's funding a research study, those observations can be manipulated. And so I really don't, I, I, I am very, very careful about what I'm listening to. It's got to make sense to me and it's got to be common sense, which that's all observation is. Always discerning with the Holy Spirit and then asking him, all right, what's the explanation for this? The world does not have that. Science does not have that because science is predicated on the rejection of a creator, the work of man's hands, witchcraft, pharmacia, sorcery, and many, many idols of experts. So I don't defer to it. I don't, I also don't defer to homeopathy or naturopathy or anyone else who's doing, you know, natural stuff, because you have to understand that the witches of old, that's exactly what they did. They brought together herbs and tinctures and things like that, that we think, oh, this is natural and this is safe. And maybe this is what God wants me to do. That's how I thought at one time. But the word says that the Lord is the one who sends diseases and he is the one who heals them and that we need to believe in that and we cannot place idols in front of him or even alongside him. He does not need anything to supplement his sovereignty and he will not yield his glory or praise to idols. So my position on this is that I don't even let there be a door open. I don't even let it be open a crack 
to where the devil can even breathe the same air I'm breathing. That door is shut and there it is bolted and it is just not ever going to be open. But my children were still sorting this through and I had been praying for them earnestly, all the time praying for them. And you know, you have your first baby. You've been raised in a world and also by a mother, by the way, you know, I went to school. I got a degree in the sciences. I taught her that that's what you do. You go to doctors. That's all we've known in the world. But being that they are godly people, they prayed about everything that they did for this baby. Every single decision that they made for this baby, they prayed about it. And so they made the decision to go to a doctor, but they would not receive treatments and things like that. It was more of like consultation. Well, if you're consulting with the enemy who has an agenda, that agenda is going to come through. He's going to do something to hook you. He's going to give you a promise. And then that agenda, you're going to start to see that agenda. So I'm going to describe that that plan, that uh, process. But the first thing I want to tell you is that I'm always telling you, you cannot discern a person. That's not what the word says. The words does not say, give them the benefit of the doubt. Oh, you think they have a good heart. Oh, they've, they're sincere. You know, I did a lot of things out of sincerity too. I used to give my daughter hot cocoa and we used to decorate a Christmas tree together. I'm giving my daughter caffeine and decorating a pagan Christmas tree. I thought that was good. I thought that was, you know, good family time. I thought that teaching her not to get married was protecting her. I also counseled people and truly thought that I was doing right, even when I didn't need it for the money because my staff were making the, bre- the bread and butter. Even when I was sick, I kept a small client lo- caseload and I would go and see those people. And then as I progressed in my illness, I started doing, you know, doing phone appointments. You can do things out of, sincere, out of a sincere heart, like out of sincerity that are 100% false and actually harmful. And that's what happens when you're speaking on the authority of the world or you're deferring to the authority of the world and you are not standing on truth, which is found in God's spirit and his word. You have to discern the spirit, not the field, not the system, not the person. You have to discern what's in them. That's what the Bible says, because we are designed to be a vessel. And so we are a vessel individually and we are also a vessel collectively, aren't we? If you think about the church, you think about the other end of things where God's spirit dwells, you think about he has told us we are a temple individually, we're also a temple collectively. Well, Satan has a house too. He has a kingdom. He also has a synagogue of Satan. And so he also dwells in people individually and collectively. And he does that in counterfeit churches. He does that in systems. He does that in fields and disciplines. And that's exactly what's going on in the field of science. So you're going to get a promise. You're going to get a promise though. Oh, we know exactly what this is. I've dealt with this and this is my expertise. And I did that for seven years, seven years straight. Everybody had a solution. But you know what? When the solution didn't work, they were nowhere to be found. No one was taking responsibility for that. No one was owning up. They didn't care. They got what they wanted. And that is the chink in their armor, that greed, that, that status, that arrogance, that pride I'm not a widow. I'll never mourn. They don't own up to it. In fact, I had doctors giving up on me and just giving me, uh, you know, giving me, um, you know, the IVs twice a week, but they had given up on even pursuing answers to what was going on with me without even saying that they had given up, without even acknowledging that they had given up. That is not the spirit of God. That is the spirit of the devil. And that those chinks in the armor of those people allows the devil to have a license to do business through them. And so that's where you start getting fields and systems and kingdoms and temples and churches where the devil is doing his work. I tell you that all the time. You got to test the spirit, discern the fruit, and stand on God's word. So I want you to listen to how this field, how Satan through this field attempted to hold on to the stronghold that he had because we were tested in every way. And I mean, every way we have been tested. You've been hearing my videos. You've been hearing me cry out. And, you know, really I was suffering so much through this and really holding faith, but there was a stronghold that needed to be broken. And I want you to pay attention to that. And I also want you to pay attention to the agenda of the devil and listen for how that was being acted out. You know that one of the things that I tell you about strongholds and spirits and 
if you want to be healed of that, you want those spirits to be cast out. Let's not say delivered. Delivered has to do with salvation. Do not say delivered. If you want to be healed, if you want that cast out of you and freed from those strongholds, you're going to have to be tested to see if you're going to choose God because those strongholds and those spirits came in because of your sin even if unknowingly, even if you did it in ignorance, remember that God says that and it's because he's disciplining you and he is, you are working out your salvation by choosing him. And I use that example of like the foundation or the structure, the frame, you know, you you build something like that, you're going to have to test it to see if it's going to fall over before you continue building. Otherwise the entire structure is going to crumble and God will not have that. Remember that he counts the cost first. So that said, we're discerning the spirit not the field, the person, the system. We're discerning the spirit in them by the fruit that they bear and by the authority on which they speak. A system that denies Christ, that says that Christ does not exist, that the creator does not exist, and that you evolved, and that the way that you continue to stay alive is by survival of the fittest, by this concept of survival of the fittest, which goes against the greatest commandment, which is to love. Now, now it is introducing this antichrist system. Anything that denies Christ is the antichrist is now anti-covenant because your covenant is a covenant of love. It can only be fulfilled in love. So now it's teaching you an anti-covenant that you look out for number one, you climb on anyone's head to get there and that your survival depends on it. That is anti-Christ and anti-covenant. What is the spirit in that field? The field that said that my daughter could not get pregnant and yet God put a baby in her within the first week of her marriage. Well, the kids decided to go to a doctor, but they decided not to take any of their treatments. They wrote a very specific birth plan and they intended on only consulting and then going to the hospital as a means of using a facility, their facility because they live in an apartment. And so, you know, a little weird to give birth in an apartment. We did have to let the neighbors downstairs know why there was so much screaming. And the doctor fully respected the birth plan, fully respected it. Well, they do in the beginning. And it is in order to hook you, okay? And again, not the person. This is the spirit, And a lot of these things have to do with their training. And I understand some of them really think that they're doing the right thing. And yet they're not. They're not doing the right thing. They wrote a very specific birth plan, gave it to the doctor. Seemed like they respected the birth plan. And then the doctor started putting pressure and saying, okay, so we're going to do, we're going to schedule your something sweep. I don't know what it is. I don't really care to even look it up. But there's some sort of a sweep that they do. And it's a natural procedure. Still doesn't matter. It, anything that you are doing to speed up God's timeline and to bypass God because you don't trust him is the work of your own hands. It's going to be a sin and it's going to upset God and you're going to have consequences for it. So it doesn't matter that they're not giving her Pitocin and they're doing this you know, natural sweep. It's not natural if it goes against what God is is going to do. So they refused it and the doctor gave her a hard time. That started it started giving her a hard time. Really? You don't want to do that? You know, I thought that you would want to make sure that you had me as your doctor to deliver the baby. And so basically now we're doing something in order to accommodate the doctor's schedule. That doesn't really make sense, does it? Accommodate the doctor's schedule rather than God's timeline. And my daughter said, no, I'm not going to do that. That's not what's important to me. What's important to me is what God is doing. Okay. Then they started fear mongering her and telling her the heart, the baby's heart rate is down. Your amni- amniotic fluid is, uh, there's no amniotic fluid. It's at uh, 1.2 and the low range is four to six. We need to induce now. We're suggesting that you go to the hospital, that you get induced right now. Let me tell you something. Neither of those things were in her chart. I don't even know that they're true, but you know what you start to think is, oh my goodness, am I making the right decision for my baby? Okay, you give the devil a little crack and he is going to slither in. It doesn't matter if it's a big hole or it's a small one. He will slither in to whatever you give him, and he will occupy at the end of the day. And so you're going to start feeling anxiety. You're going to start second-guessing yourself. You're going to start doubting. And you know why? Because God has designed you to be single-minded, not lukewarm. 
and I'm not saying that they were being lukewarm. They were praying. God was sorting it through with them. He was building them in this process, but he was also teaching them, look what happens when you play. Look what happens when you play with the world. Even just that little bit, it created so much distress for my family to continuously hear things like this. Whether it was true or not, God is the one who makes the decision on whether he's going to bring to deliverance, to delivery. He has likened our salvation to deliverance, guys. That's what deliverance is, not casting out spirits. Delivery, deliverance, if you look up the context of deliverance, always has to do with us meeting Christ in the sky and our salvation being fulfilled so that it's not revoked. Think about that doctrine. Why did the devil plant that? He doesn't want you to understand, does he? God will bring to deliverance, will bring to delivery, but there's going to be a lot of labor here. You understand? You're working something out. You are working out your salvation. And when that salvation comes, when that delivery, deliverance comes, it will be irrevocable. Why in Revelation 12 does the woman, Zion, who is in labor or who is uh, giving birth to a son, and then you see in Isaiah that it says, before the birth pains come, she gives birth to a son. Who's ever heard of such a thing? And then the pains come, and here comes the church. Here come her other children. So here's another thing that we experienced was, I told you a couple weeks ago that we were told that she was in labor. She was at, point, at uh, three centimeters, and that's their definition of labor. So they like to redefine things because the word tells me that when the birth pains come, that's when you're in labor. And she didn't have any birth pains for two weeks. And so here we're being told she's in labor, that she has lost the water that the baby is supposed to be in, and that she's at 1.2 when low is four to six, that the heart rate is going down. We're being told all of these things. And you know what? I'm going to tell you, I spoke with a woman who now is a midwife, which, you know, I don't necessarily agree. What I wanted to understand is what is your experience? What is the process? And this is a, you know, this is someone who is, um, also in Christ, but maybe also as being taught what to discern. Still kind of talking about like herbs and, you know, things like that and and referring back to uh, back to the hospital. And so I'm not comfortable with that. Like I discern that not to be not to be quite right. But a lot of the things, you know, I, I, I wanted to understand what her experience had been working in hospitals because she is one who left working in hospitals to go and do a different route. So to me, it sounds like God is still building her understanding and discernment. In any event, when I shared this with her, she told me this is what they do in the hospitals, that they fear monger women in order, they will do anything to get you to induce because it gives them control over the birth, over the labor and delivery. They will do anything to frighten you into induction which by the way, creates complications, puts more stress on the mother and on the baby. And so these are the things that they do. Okay. So this person is telling me that they will do that, but who's really doing that? If you think about the spirit that is behind it, that's all he's interested in. That's all he wants to do is get control. And why? Because he's had a stronghold on our family. And if he can't get to me, he's going to keep trying to get to my children, isn't he? Well, we broke that. We broke that. He no longer has access to my family, but we had to break it through testing because God has to test and he's got to shake that structure and see if it's standing up, see if it's sturdy. And if there's anything that's loose, he's got to tighten it up again. And that's going to be painful. It's going to be really painful. There's going to be a faith walk in that. There's going to be a journey in that. So they were claiming that the placenta was calcified the, and failing. And so the baby wasn't getting oxygen, that they were really worried about the baby, same field that kills babies is worried that the baby's going to die, right? Like I, you got to decide, you know, are you for life or are you not? That they were really worried about the baby. By the way, those numbers that they gave never even documented in her chart. I would think that if they were so worried that they would have documented that in her chart. And one of the things that the midwife told me who left medicine she told me that, first of all, they'll do anything to do an induction. They will lie to you. And that if that truly was happening, they would have called CPS. Well, that's also a problem, okay? Because no one has a right to tell you what you must do with your child. What spirit is that? It's interesting to me that there are so many children, and I was one of them, you know that, where DCFS was called every single year, and they never removed us from my father's home. But someone, a godly family, 
that is trying to do the best for their child in God and says to the doctors, which my children did, they said to the doctor, we don't make decisions this way. We go home and pray. And that's what we're going to do. And they said, yeah, but no, there's no but after that. It's God's decision. Do you know that they went home and it wasn't just that day. They, they were getting two to four calls a day from this system, two to four calls a day. Why in the world would someone be that invested in making sure that you submit unless the spirit of Satan is in them? What are they so nervous about? There was still movement in that baby. My daughter was not feeling in distress physically. She was feeling in distress over the emotional manipulation that was going on with this field, over that control that he kept trying to take back. And then she would start freaking out when he didn't move for an hour and maybe was taking a nap. So I drove all the way out here and we laid hands on her stomach and that little boy moved. He moved more than I've ever felt him move. Even on the day of delivery yesterday, which was a full day event, and I'm sorry I didn't, I posted one video with him crying so that you could hear his little voice, but we um, had a very full day yesterday. Yesterday, they called four times, four times, four times to let them, to let her know that they had scheduled her induction, which she never okayed. She had rejected and denied, said, I'm not going to get that. And to tell her what she was going to do. That's what they did. Is there a spiritual battle here? Do you see that there's a spiritual battle here for that stronghold to maintain that stronghold and tell her what she was going to do? Well, I'm here to tell you that God has installed wisdom into your design to know what's going on in your body and what you need to do. And so many things went wrong according to medicine yesterday and according to medicine throughout this birth. And this baby, we were told, could die at any minute. And we, these are the things we were contending with. These are the reasons I was so distressed in some of my videos, why it was that I was reading and just trying to stay sane and taking you along for those scripture studies so I could stand, so I could stand, so I could stand. And I wasn't being in, I wasn't giving full disclosure because I didn't have permission yet to share the testimony. And I, I understand why, because we didn't, we didn't know yet what God was doing. And now looking back, we can understand that he was revealing his glory and he was breaking that stronghold and he wanted to show us all of the things that could go wrong. And let me tell you, some things went wrong and we freaked and panicked and we got a healthy baby boy that my son-in-law and I delivered in their home. My daughter wasn't butchered in the process because they want to do an episiotomy and an epidural and a, you know, uh, uh, goodness, when they cut the stomach, I can't think of the name. She didn't need any of that. We prayed consistently throughout, throughout. We kept praying. We kept standing on his word as we were coaching. We kept reminding her that God is in control of her design. Listen to what he's speaking into your body. Listen to what he's telling you to do. Trust what he's built in your body. We kept standing on his word. And there were a couple times where there were moments of panic and they said, we got it. We, we have to do this. You know, the placenta was in her for three hours. It's only supposed to supposedly be in there for 30 minutes. Well, you know what? God brought it out. And that was one of the things that was interesting because I had called, you know, I had called the midwife who I was speaking with and she said, well, after an hour, there's certain things that, that we start doing in order to get the placenta out and that it was, you know, that it was of concern. And so we had, you know, these moments of panic, right? There, there were moments, but then we had to stand on, God just delivered this beautiful baby boy. He can deliver a placenta. God put this baby in your womb when medicine said you couldn't have one. God is the one who brings to delivery and he will bring this to delivery and you will be okay. And she is okay and actually recovering very well, not walking around like she just got butchered. She was, you know, on not laying down in a bed in a controlled medicalized birth. Most of the time for 10 hours, she was on all fours because that is what God put in your design. That's where you're most comfortable is on all fours. So why would a woman need to lay down on her back and restrict all of that flow? You know, this kind of, this kind of, like, or that, that, like you're restricting your hips and your pelvis where the baby is going to come out. You don't need to do that, but they want control over everything. And it's because that spirit 
wants control over everything. He wants to fear monger you into submitting. And you're going to have to make a choice about what spirit you submit to because that choice is coming up. And you remember that mark or that seal is going to define your entire existence. It's going to define eternity for you. And that is, it was a very important choice that these parents made, not only for them, for them as individuals, but for their family and for their son. And I have watched them stand. I've watched them stand at school when professors were saying that we're teaching things that were anti-Christ at their Christian school, by the way, counterfeit Christian school. I've watched them stand and, and take chances on getting hits in their grades, being retaliated against by their peers. They have stood in Christ-like integrity, in truth and fidelity to God. Four calls yesterday, four calls. While we were battling, there was a battle going on over there and Satan was trying to enter. Boy, was he panicking, huh? Why? Why would four calls even be necessary? This baby went two weeks past term, past his due date. And in medicine, that is a high-risk pregnancy. The placenta was in two and a half hours longer than, according to medicine, it should be in. And God made everything good. He conformed everything for good for those who stand in faith, for those who stand in truth and fidelity to him. That, those calls and those fear tactics are the result of a spirit that is losing control. It's not man. They don't even know what's going on. They don't even know how they're being used. That is the result of a spirit that's losing control. Let me tell you the treatments that we used. We got our community together and we fasted and prayed. We fasted twice together. Everyone was praying unceasingly. My daughter had prayed that if God did not want her to go to the hospital to make it happen at home because she was still at the very end, you know, just really trying to endure one step at a time. And that's our faith walk, you guys. Sometimes we can't say, well, I'll for sure not, you know, like not be doing this. You know, when it comes to your baby, it's very scary. You've just carried that baby for, I mean, she's been like a hundred months pregnant by now. I mean, she's not, she's a little girl. I don't even know how she was carrying that baby. He's a 9.2 pound baby, but she kept praying and she kept enduring. And, you know, when they'd schedule her for an appointment for these high risk tests and everything else, you know, she would pray and she would pray and she would pray and she'd wake up in the middle of the night when she couldn't go to sleep and she'd read her Bible and she'd sit with God and she would just tell him. I'm going to give you like the last bit of the last bit that I have, Lord, please be faithful. And she would go through the feelings of anger, just like I shared my feelings of anger with you while I was going through it. Where's, where are you? Please show up. The feelings of abandonment. She kept pushing through and she prayed that if God did not want her to go to the hospital to make it happen at home. And so she went as long as she could at home. And then there came a point where she said to us, and I didn't even know I, I had no idea that she had, pray, you know, that this was what she, or kind of her agreement with God. But at a certain point, she said, even if I wanted to go to the hospital, I can't, I can't, like my contractions are too close together. I can't, I, I couldn't move. And she pressed through and she did as much as she could and then came to that point. And there were moments where she was panicking and saying, I, I need to go. I need to go. I need to go get an epidural. This is too painful. This is, I, I, something's wrong. Something's wrong. You know, these kinds of things. She kept pushing through. There were so many tests along the way and so many things that completely defied what is taught in medicine, what is taught in the sciences. These are the main ones, the main things that happened. But if you can just try to put yourself in that position of really standing in faith and even to the point of Abraham, you know, even to the point of Abraham that when God tells you, you do not submit to other gods and you follow what I have said, that we keep enduring in what he has said, that he is God, that he is the one who delivers, that he is the one who gives life. He is the one who takes life. He's the one who decides these things. And consistently she kept leaning into him and listening to his instruction and standing on his word. The baby and his mama are completely healthy, bonding at home, not being coveted by any false gods. God knows what to do with his creations. He gave us wisdom to do what needed to be done. And yet things still went wrong and he conformed everything perfectly. I want you to remember 
this lesson of uh, bullying that the devil is going to do because I kept telling my daughter through this whole thing, this feels like a battle. This is a spiritual battle. And I knew that it had to do with that little window, that little crack that was given to the devil, that we really have to make our choice known and we have to stand firm in it. And my friend Connie today, when I was talking with her, said that, um, you know, she said, I I don't like to... uh, uh, I, you know, I tend to put meaning to everything or try to find meaning in everything. And it almost was like she was apologizing for that. Don't apologize for that. That's a good thing. That's good. Because you know what? There is meaning in everything. God knows what he's doing in every single thing. There is nothing that does not have meaning. We just haven't perceived it. And she started talking about the 12 spies and how they were afraid to go to battle and take that land because these were people who were tall. They were Nephilim. They were much bigger than them, much more powerful than them. And yet you see throughout scripture that God takes a smaller army. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the things that we have placed focus and emphasis on, that we've placed value and priority on. The strength of man, what is that? Can you fight against God and win? We don't need to be afraid of the devil. We don't need to be afraid of what the devil does in these systems and people. The scare tactics and the fear mongering because we have a God who has all power. The devil doesn't even have power, but what God, what God has given him permission to do for his purpose. And so if you know that, then you just turn to him. Even when you're doing it in this faith walk, step by step by step. You're taking it as it comes because you're being built and you have to understand that he's going to test your foundation and he's going to test that frame and he's going to test everything he's building in you to make sure that it's sturdy, to make sure there are no cracks in it because you are working out your salvation and because that is required in order to be brought to delivery. He had to work out every single thing in that little baby, building him weaving him together in his mother's womb. He knows how long he needs to be there. Who has a right to say, we're going to take this baby because I want him to be born on such and such a date, or I want this doctor to be the one who delivers him? Who has that right? That's a disgusting, satanic practice of trying to control what is due to God, to trying to control and covet and usurp his power, his glory, and his plan. And this baby came right on time. And he's perfect. He's so perfect. And I was so blessed to be there, to be there and be a part of that. Coach my daughter with her husband, who was, I mean, the coach of all coaches, right? Except for God, of course, of course. But God gave us wisdom through that whole situation. And the whole time I was thinking, I was thinking about, you know, as we were coaching her, we were laboring with her too. You know, she was. If you've never been through labor, you get desperate in your own body. You just feel desperate. And we were holding her up by her hands and so that she could just, you know, like be dead weight, you know? And uh, and she was screaming, hold me, hold me up, please hold me up. And it was killing my back because I'm short. I'm really short. My daughter's much taller than I am. Her husband's taller than her. But it, I mean, both of us, both her husband and I were laboring with her. Uh, absolutely not to the extent she was laboring, obviously, but we were ho- pulling, her, uh, you know, holding her up. She was pulling on us. We were bent forward, like our backs are killing us today. We labored together, and it was, it was so incredible. And I was sitting there thinking, like, okay, what does God want me to understand about this? Like every step, as we were going through that, I was thinking. I I was realizing this is how we labor together as a church. And that's what my friends did for me. And so, and you know who you are. All of you who prayed and fasted and encouraged me, God bless you. And I know he will. That's what we need to be doing. And I want you to remember that because that's what the multitude in white robes are going to be doing. They're going to be laboring together. They're going to be encouraging one another. They're going to be standing and saying, no, you don't need to go to false gods to tell you whether you will live or die. Remember what happened to Ahaziah? He fell through the lattice in the roof and he sent his men to go consult with Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, as to whether he would live or die. And Elijah told them, because you have done this, you will surely die. Is there no God in Israel that you have gone to this false god to find out whether you will live or die? You're going to need to remind each other of that so that you can stand 
so that you can stand in your faith and not choose any of these antichrists, which are the antichrist, which are the spirit of the antichrist made manifest in the Catholic church, in the prostitutes that bore out of her through the Protestant reformation who continue with that cross to Tammuz, that idol, that image that they have set up who make Christianity about politics, who speak on the authority of the world, who continue to, to collect that tax that maintains the royal splendor that they call tithing, even though tithing was fulfilled through sacrifice, who lift up pagan holidays and know nothing of God's holy days because they've replaced them, who observe counterfeit Sabbath and teach you how to celebrate Easter during Passover, one of the greatest holy days to be remembering the sacrifice of Christ. You're going to need to stand because it's going to be hard and you're going to have to remind yourself when your life and your family's life is on the line and you're being coerced into doing things that you know are anti-Christ, you're going to have to be like Abraham. You're going to have to make that decision and fear God, not fearing those who kill the body, but the one who can kill the soul in hell. Thank you so much for trudging this with me. It has been an incredibly difficult time. And now our grief has been turned to joy. And that's what's going to happen when Christ comes back for us as long as we have fulfilled this covenant. Thank you for listening. God bless you. And I'll see you in the next video. And also, those of you who are in Bible study, Bible study is on tonight. I will still be doing Bible study. I love you guys.